Today we push on with the novels of Charles Dickens. We're now on his third book, Nicholas Nickleby, which he actually started writing while he was still writing Oliver Twist. For me, this is the strongest Dickens novel so far. It's a great comeback from Oliver Twist, which I do think was a bit of a disappointment when compared to the Pickwick papers. And I think it manages to blend what was good about Oliver Twist with what was great about the Pickwick papers. And it's also loaded with some fantastic characters as well. Part one, summary. The life and adventures of Nicholas Nickleby begins when Nicholas and his family lose their fortune after the death of their patriarch. Fallen on hard times, they turn to Mr. Nickleby's brother, Ralph Nickleby, for help. Ralph is cruel and a miser, and he takes an immediate dislike to the moralistic Nicholas. He agrees to help, however, by placing Nicholas as a tutor at a school, Doth Boys Hall. When Nicholas arrives at the school, he finds nothing but abuse and exploitation. At the school, Nicholas befriends one of the boys named Smike, and after a violent standoff with the owners of Doth Boys, the two of them flee to London where Nicholas tries to make his fortune while Ralph Nickleby plots his downfall. Part 2. A Pastoral Adventure Nicholas Nickleby sees Dickens combining the overarching narrative plot of Oliver Twist with the more pastoral episodic stuff and the whimsy and humour of the Pickwick Papers, and for the most part, he succeeds in this. One of my main issues with the Pickwick Papers is that because of the episodic nature of the plot, the enjoyment of the story sometimes comes in waves. If you've got a really good episode, it's fantastic and it's great, but if there's a dud episode, it can be a bit boring, and sometimes you can get a couple of duds in a row. The story is also broken up by these short narratives, and taken on their own, these short narratives are great, but taken as a whole, sometimes they just again disrupt the flow of the overall story, and if they're duds, they're just uninteresting. Worst of all, there were some characters in the Pickwick Papers who would appear in a set in a way that way you would think they would be quite prominent, and then they just vanish for ages, because again, if they're not in the episode, they're not in the episode. And so those things meant that the book didn't really hang together as a whole. It felt too episodic and too unstructured, and the characters, some were fantastic, but some just weren't there enough to really leave a lasting impact. With Oliver Twist, Dickens seemed to overcorrect. Instead of giving us this episodic thing, he gave us something with a much more substantial plot, following the protagonist, Oliver Twist, and on his adventures. The book does have a little bit of the episodic feel at the beginning, but once Oliver arrives in London and falls in with Fagin, the plot really does take over. Unfortunately, the book was let down a little bit by the lack of interest in Dickens' main character, Oliver, who basically vanishes in places and doesn't really have much involvement in the resolution of his own plot. The plot itself is also somewhat weak. There are good aspects to it, Oliver falling in with Fagin and the like. Nancy's trying to help Oliver is also a great bit in her relationship with Bill, but as a whole, there are too many contrivances in the plot for it to really be very believable. With Nicholas Nickleby, we do get another whimsical adventure that's much more episodic than Oliver Twist, but it does also have an overarching narrative structure, and it has a great protagonist. Nicholas and his family have fallen on hard times, they need help, and the overarching narrative is Nicholas and his sister trying to make their way in the world now that they've lost their father. And of course we have Ralph as the overarching villain constantly in the shadows trying to undo them. And so the whole novel is built around this. Even when we get the more episodic parts, when Nicholas is doing this and that, it still is gelled together by this overarching thing. It makes sense that Dickens would have chosen this style again. He succeeded so well with the Pickwick Papers. But what I like about Nicholas Nickleby is that it does have that overarching thing, because it glues together the episodes, and so it doesn't feel as episodic and random, and you don't have that issue as much where characters just disappear and don't play any role in the story. Dickens still does rely on some plot contrivances every now and then, and I think that's just something that I have to accept if I'm reading Dickens, uh, but I do think it's less offensive here, and I think part of that is because he's falling back into that Pickwick Papers pastoral style. When you've got a plot and an atmosphere that's sort of whimsical and silly, then you can sort of get away a bit more with those kinds of contrivances, whereas when you're telling something a bit more serious, like Oliver Twist, it just doesn't, isn't as satisfying to do that. In any case, you can certainly feel him developing as a writer in this book. Part 3. Nicholas Nickleby, The Empty Oliver So in my review of Oliver Twist, I did say how I thought that he was just a spectator in his own story. 
Now, while there might be good reason for that thematically, I did suggest that it does make him a kind of dull protagonist. And it's also a shame because Oliver does have one moment of fire, but it's quickly gone and we never see it again. I also suggested that maybe Dickens got bored with Oliver Twist towards the end, or at least bored with Oliver's character, and that's why Oliver doesn't appear in the story very much. And given that he started writing Nicholas Nickleby during Oliver Twist, and given that the kind of character that Nicholas Nickleby is, I do sometimes wonder if maybe he just got so caught with Nicholas Nickleby as a protagonist that he did genuinely lose interest in Oliver by comparison. In many ways, Nicholas is just a reaction to Oliver. He's everything that Oliver isn't. They both have a strong moral outlook, but Nicholas is forthright about it, whereas Oliver is meek. Aside from one moment where Oliver does get into a fight, the rest of the book he's a complete coward, whereas Nicholas is constantly beating people up, threatening people who disrespect him or his sister or anyone that he cares about. And he's also free where Oliver is trapped. Nicholas goes to London and he's able to make his way and fight his way through many trials and tribulations, whereas Oliver is just weakly passed from pillar to post. Now that is important for Oliver Twist. It is a story about the powerlessness of children, so I'm not knocking it for that reason. I think it works within that narrative, but it does make Oliver a dull protagonist in a way that Nicholas certainly is not. Some of the best moments of Nicholas just being completely outrageous are when he first meets his uncle Ralph and he sees him for what he is right at the beginning and is just not having it. And then when he goes to the school, he gets sick of the cruelty going on and he just beats up uh, Mr. Squeers, the, the master of the school. And when he hears a lord disparaging his sister and saying some crude things about her, he follows the man home and ends up in a fight with him that sends the man ill for most of the book. He just isn't taking any nonsense, any evil from anyone. There are also some parallels between Dickens and Nicholas Nickleby. Dickens actually shares Nicholas's passion for the theatre, and when he was younger, Dickens did try to be an actor, um, and that would have been his actual preferred career. And that makes sense given how the way that Dickens writes, he does write in a very theatrical way, and he really enjoyed performing his stories as well. And knowing this about Dickens gives me an even deeper appreciation for the theatrical nature of his works. All of Dickens' characters would do great on a stage, and I think that's why his books do so well as audiobooks. And one thing that I always recommend to anyone who struggles with Dickens is get a good audiobook, because it just comes to life, especially when you get a great voice actor or actress doing it. Now, some people dislike Nicholas Nickleby and argue that he's a kind of functional character. I don't really know what that means in this context, just because I think that Nicholas is such a powerful character that's so involved in the goings-on in the story that drives the narrative. And yes, he can be a little bit predictable in terms of how he reacts to things, because you know what his moral outlook is, but I still find him incredibly engaging, even if he's not the most dynamic of protagonists. I actually think that Kate is a somewhat more dynamic character because there's this disconnect between the mild way that she acts sometimes and this moral, uh, high moral mindedness that she shares with Nicholas. But I'll talk about Kate a little bit more later. Part four, good is beautiful and always wins, bad is ugly and always loses. So as I've suggested, Nicholas Nickleby is a theatrical comedy for the most part. Now, the rules of comedy often mean that the good must win and the bad must lose, and the good are usually going to be portrayed as attractive, and the bad are usually going to be portrayed as grotesques. Now, Nicholas Nickleby does conform to most of those tropes of comedy, but it's not all fun and laughter. There is a genuine moment of pathos in tragedy in the character of Smike, the abused boy from Dothboy's Hall, who Nicholas rescues. The book also exposes the corruption of schools like Dothboy's, which actually existed. Doth Boys was based on a real school called Bowes Academy, where boys were basically treat maltreated, underfed, and the schools would take money from parents who couldn't afford the to actually raise their children. They send them off to these schools, the schools underfeed them, cram them in um, so that they basically starve to death. Uh, and this was a real thing that happened. Dickens saw some of these schools and was ho rightly horrified by them and wanted to expose them. So we do get a lot of the social commentary that we get in Dickens' books, although it does generally have this comedic feel. Now, the moralistic intentions of Nicholas Nickleby do sometimes weaken the book, I think. Dickens is a believer in physiognomy, which is this practice of assessing someone's moral character based on their outer appearance. Now, I don't personally think there's anything wrong with using this as a literary device every now and then as a way to signal something, but if you overdo it, then it makes your story predictable and reductive because it quickly becomes obvious whether someone is good or bad simply based on the way they look. 
and it does lead to some simplistic character psychology as well. Also Dickens does that thing that moralists tend to do which is at the end of the novel they have to explain how all of the bad characters met bad ends or all of the good characters met good ends except for Smike who tragically uh, passes away. That's not to say that the bad should always win. Ralph's downfall I think is actually fantastic and the reason for this is because it stems from his character and it's also very tightly plotted. Watching Ralph's descent in the final chapters is delightful because of how well Dickens sets it up. That said, the book does have some great villains, obviously Ralph being chief among them, and a lot of them do have at least moments of conflict in their souls. Ralph, sometimes when he's thinking about Kate and doing terrible things to her, does have some kind of conflict in whether or not he wants to. Ultimately, when he sees that Kate is just like Nicholas, he, he, he dislikes her just as much, but he does have moments where he thinks, am I, am I doing something bad here? Although he does quickly talk himself out um, out of his conscience. I also like the scenes with Ralph when he's talking to some of his cronies because you get this sense that they're not really friends with Ralph. They're all just out for themselves and they're constantly trying to backstab each other uh, and it becomes a kind of game of wits which is quite entertaining to read. Obviously Ralph mostly comes out on top of these things. Nevertheless it's entertaining to see how these villains relate to each other. Another great villain is Mr. Mantellini, an exploitative womanizer who's married to Madame Mantellini. And when he's in a good mood, he flatters her with compliments and because she's got a bit of an ego, she takes it. And then whenever things are going wrong, he will threaten suicide in a very manipulative way. He's a very theatrical character, but he is a character that we all know. <laughs> you know, this sort of using mental health or using weakness as a way to manipulate someone into doing what you want. It's a very powerful move and it's parodied to a, a wonderful degree with Mr. Mantellini. And it's a very satisfying moment when Madame Mantellini realises this and tells him to get the hell out. And of course we have the wonderfully named Squeers family who run Doth Boys Hall. The ugly connection is summed up perfectly by their family name. These are probably the most grotesque characters in the story. All of them, whether it's Wackford Squeers the father or Fanny Squeers the daughter or their mother, he is, they are just some disgusting characters. But what's more horrifying is that these really are based on real people. And so in a sense, they're not really exaggerations. I mean, they might be somewhat theatrical because it's Dickens, but they genuinely were people who felt that it was acceptable to treat children like this. And so it's pretty disgusting in a way, and it makes it all the more satisfying when they meet the ends that they eventually get. It's a sad truth, but sometimes people are just rotten to the core, willing to exploit others, be cruel, or to make money, or whatever it is that gets them going. And Dickens does a great job of just showing that sometimes. Part five, being fair to the ladies. So as is always the case with Dickens books, uh, reviewers constantly lambast Dickens for his female characters because they don't live up to the girl boss stereotypes that modern readers love. It's the same tired old trope every time. Dickens reduces his women characters either to angels that are too good for this world or evil harridans. I might do a full video defending Dickens' women at some point, but for now I'm just going to limit it to this section and my interpretations of the women in this book. The only character that really fits the too good for this world insipidness is Madeline, who reminds me a lot actually of Oliver Twist, in that both characters are supposed to have a major presence in their story, but ultimately they're devoid of action, agency, and they barely exist. Madeline is Nicholas's main love interest in the story and she's in a terrible situation. She's attached to her father um, who is abusive and horrible and that does in some sense give a rationale for her personality, why she's so timid and quiet. She is the victim of abuse. She's probably constantly living in fear. So again you have to be somewhat fair to her character. It's not like Dickens is just creating her as weak because he thinks women are weak. He's creating someone who's in a terrible situation. She's a child living with her father who's constantly being abused by him. So it sort of makes sense that she's like that, but she is kind of insipid and does fit that classic Dickens mould if you like. Kate Nickleby is a more interesting version of Madeline because she does have that feminine softness that people probably will just mean that they immediately put her into this too good for this world category, but she is also as willful as Nicholas. It's in a more feminine way, but it's still there. There are several parts in the novel where she does stand up for herself and she's perfectly capable of doing so, even when it puts her in danger. We also have Madame Mantellini, who is a great comic side character with the plot with her husband. She starts off as 
you know, buying into her husband's manipulation. But ultimately, she comes to realise it and stands up for herself. And that's one of the highlights of the story. And then there's Mrs Nickleby herself, who is a very bizarre character. On the one hand, she comes across as a bit ditzy, a bit of a muddlehead, prone to just go on these long digressions, which seem completely irrelevant and detached from the thing that she should be talking about. She's a bit of a snob. She has a high opinion of herself. But every now and then she displays the kind of wisdom in some of the things that she says, whether it's predicting things about the fates of her children or just saying little things every now and then. So again, there's a sort of unsurety about where her character truly fits. In sum, I think that there's a lot going on with the female characters in the story and these reductive analyses that I see time and time again just come across as lazy. I haven't read all of Dickens' novels, but I have found that in most of the books that I've read, the female characters are just as compelling as the male ones. And sometimes I wonder if the issue there is with the lack of substance of the critics rather than a lack of substance in Dickens. But in any case, let me know what you think about the female characters in this book, the female characters in Dickens more generally, and maybe if you're interested in a longer video, maybe we can get into that. But I'll have to read more Dickens before I can get there. Part six, conclusion. Overall, I really enjoyed Nicholas Nickleby. As I said, I think it's a big improvement over the previous two books. That's not to say that the Pickwick Papers is bad, I thought it was great. Oliver Twist, I'm a bit iffy on. There are some great parts to that. There are some less good bits. But what Nicholas Nickleby does really well is combines what worked in both novels and puts them together and creates something that's even better than both. Nicholas Nickleby is a great lead for the story. He's more engaging than Oliver Twist. I like his relationships with the main characters. Ralph Nickleby is a fantastic villain as well. And the book, of course, has amazing side characters and side plots, which Dickens is always does very well. All right, that's it for this video. Let me know down in the comments what you think of Dickens, what you think of this book, and any other things that I've said in this video. Look forward to discussing all of that with you in the comments. Take care, everyone. Ta-ra!